Chapter 16. Towers. You see, we remain the very picture of courtesy, even in the face of such impolite accusations. We have nothing to hide here. Manhattan. Just over 200 years ago, it was a thriving, bustling metropolis. Manhattan had, was hailed as the most cosmopolitan city in all of Equestria. Millions of ponies lived or worked in the city. It was home to some of the most elite circles of equestrian society. Then, in an instant, Manhattan was gone. Millions of ponies were consumed in a flash of light, heat, and magical energy. Hundreds of thousands more were killed by the shockwave and the Eltrich green fires that incinerated virtually everything that was left standing. Now, all that remained of Manhattan in the aftermath of that apocalypse were the Manhattan ruins. Miles upon miles of maze-like urban devastation and ashes under the shadows of skeletal skyscrapers that rose out of the wreckage like monolithic tombstones. A pony might wonder how such a holocaust could have been allowed to happen. How could Equestria's enemies have smuggled such catastrophic weaponry into the very heart of our grandest and largest metropolis? I found it much easier to understand now that I knew the most significant public transportation company in Manhattan was run by traitorous ponies, loyal to Equestria's enemies, and that the basement of that very facility had been staging a staging ground for the zebra operations within our homeland. I stared into the eyes of the zombie zebras and realized this was how they had gotten the balefire bomb into Manhattan. That these zebras had been responsible for the murder of millions. I also realized that the mini stable under four stars fell far short of stable tech quality. For all the harm stable techs playing around had done, these ponies really knew how to build a survival shelter. This inferior stable had not been able to stop the magical radiation from bleeding in, transforming the zebras and almost a dozen ponies it had been intended to protect into a ghoulish creatures before me. And yes, I realized they might not be zombie zebras so much as ghoul zebras. I say I didn't care, but part of me actually hoped they were ghouls as I stepped back out of the way. Steel hooves! Give him everything you got! The fog lifted by mid-afternoon, revealing the graveyard of the Manhattan ruins. Beneath the sky of rolling, angry gray, we walked above it, single file, along a twin monorail of the Luna Line. Looking down the blocks of the city rubble below, in all directions we saw collapsed and gutted buildings, blackened chariots and wagons, detritus and blown litter that coagulated around the metal shafts of shattered street light, shattered street lamps. No skeletons though. The living creatures of Manhattan had been reduced to nothing more than ash, mixing with the ash from a billion other sources as well as it carried away by the wind. I was beginning to spot a few pieces or places where green bale fire still burned. I wondered how even bale fire could have survived for centuries. The wind carried particles of rust and ash, as well as the smell of the urban graveyard. A symphony of creaks and groans haunted the city, mixing with the sounds of shifting and crumbling concrete and the hammering of wind-blown metal. Occasionally, occasionally, staccatos of gunfire usually distant and carried on echoes, reminded us that there were raiders, scavengers, and other ponies lurking, hidden, and darkened structures. A flash of green and gold shot past us from behind. A magnificent bird, both terrifying and graceful, which spread its wings and circled us, as if taking our measure. Its eyes seemed to glow with licks of balefire that fell from its beak. What is that? Velvet Remedy asked with a tone and awe before she could have the words to ask for myself. Balefire Phoenix, Steelhooves replied, whistling slightly. The green and gold bird completed its circle, then swooped down 
and away. It was appearing from sight as it treaded through shadowed alleys. We began to move again, all except Velvet Remedy, who just stood there as if mesmerized. She turned to Steel Hooves and asked demandingly, Tell me more about them. Whiningly, we all halted again. Entering interest, interesting fact about traveling single file. If one pony stops, unless they're at the back, travel tends to stop with them. I found myself staring at the ruined billboard, whose bottle of Sparkle Cola Rad seemed to actually glow. It's like a buck in the face, with radishes. Billboards littered the sky along the Luna Line like weeds. The Manhattan Gardens was the largest wildlife sanctuary of its kind, home to the most exotic and admired creatures, all of which were instantly cremated when the zebra's balefire bomb detonated, Steel Hooves explained. Of course, a phoenix doesn't exactly have the same relationship with being turned to ash that most creatures do. Steel Hooves chuckled. I wouldn't be thinking to try to domesticate one, though. They breathe fire. A battered sea blue mare flew out of a doorless storefront and started running down the street, tears streaming from her eyes as she screamed. A dozen raider ponies, each carrying a brutal weapon and wearing an old roller derby helmet, came tearing out of the building after her, jumping out the windows and charging out the door, whooping and laughing. Help me! She stumbled as she ran, her gambled cop. Blood ran down between her thighs. I could see her bleeding through my scope. Somebody, please help me! She'd already been raped repeatedly. Now they had let her go and were chasing her for sport. From the height of the Luna line, they were too far for sats to effectively lock on. So I trailed the scope in front of the first raider. A motley gray, a brown and gray pony. With a cutie mark of a skull with burning eyes. I aimed for where he was about to be, as Calamity instructed. Good. Now keep her steady, and squeeze out a burst. I magically pulled the trigger. Three shots spat out from the scope. Zebra assault carbine. Silence weapons, I learned, were not really silent, but the dampened sound was lost in the wind, and the weight of the silencer helped to soften the recoil and keep the rifle on target between bursts. The raider pony burst into flame. He fell to the ground, screaming and thrashing. I stepped back, floating up the rifle to check the clip while Calamity took a shot. No, I hadn't accidentally loaded magical bullets. The zebra rifle had enchanted the bullet itself. Stick a horn where Celestia don't shine. If this was the sort of weapons that zebras had been carrying into the battlefield. The screams of the victim mare blow wrenched my attention back to the battle. Calamity fired off a second shot. Pulling the scope to my eyes, I saw that three of the raiders were now dead, one of the corpses burning in the street, while the others were scattering. The panicking mare screamed, her hoofs catching on a toppled street lamp, and fell, skidding across the debris-strewn street. One of the raiders was still charging towards her. I swung the scope towards him, and froze, as if I really saw him. One of the rapists had been a blank-flanked colt. I stared, following the very young pony with the zebra's rifle scope, trembling slightly. He was wearing a Colt's roller derby helmet, and clenched a serrated knife in his mouth. I could see her blood on him. I focused, the trigger of the zebra rifle moving slightly. I couldn't! It was a Colt! Horrified, I watched as the Colt reached the fallen mare, dodging the kicks she threw at him. I heard the crack of gunfire feed from me and saw the colt's bloody ru body rupture bloodily in two places, hit with enough force to fling his corpse against a nearby mailbox. I lowered the zebra rifle and turned to stare at Calamity in shock. On the other side of him, Velvet Remedy's eyes were wide. What? Calamity asked before flying down to help the mare. Did I steal your shot? Ponies love laughter. Zebras do not understand joy and fear it.
Ponies are honest. Zebras only tell lies. Ponies are loyal. Zebras will knife you in the back. Ponies are generous. Zebras are selfish and greedy. Ponies care about each other. Zebras care only about themselves. I stared up at the billboard and thought, wow, that's, that's just wrong, Velvet Remedy said, breaking the uncomfortable silence that had become our traveling companions since Calamity shot the Raider Colt. The twin monorail tracks looked as, took a graceful curve, and the billboard was mounted across the flying buttress of a squatted skyscraper placed so that the train ponies would see it as they approached the turn. It would have dominated the view at one side of the elevated train as it took the bend. Calamity had flown off ahead, more to give us space than for a need to scout. The Luna line seemed free of threats. I really wanted a party time mental. I didn't have any particular need for one, but I felt myself craving the effects, especially the intellectual boost. I just couldn't think, I, I could just think so much faster, so much more clearly when benefiting from the PTM. I was more aware, my senses more acute. If that's what party time mentals did for me, I began to wonder what they did for Pinkie Pie. I found myself thinking about four stars again. Based on what we found in the mini stable, which wasn't much after Steel Hoof's ordinance had finished off the zebras, the Ministry of Morale must have happened the same morning as the Balefire Bomb was set off. It occurred to me that the Mega Spell was probably in transit when they attacked. The Ministry of Morale had brought in Steel Rangers. They knew what they were heading into and called for the big guns. Knowing where to look, who to interrogate, did that come from the skill of the ponies in her employ? Or did Pinkie Pie herself discern these things with the power of PTM enhanced acutement. Bias, I presumed, the latter. No matter what negative effects she might have suffered from P PTM addiction, Pinkie Pie had intuition that bordered on precognition. The traitors were terrified of her ministry. She had them paranoid and scurrying. No matter what any pony say about either her or her ministry, Pinkie Pie had come heartbreakingly close to saving Manhattan. I stopped, looked out over the desolate urban maze. Millions of ponies had died here, their salvation racing the clock and losing. I had to find something else to think about. I switched to DJ Pone 3's radio broadcast, listening to it in my earloom. It was merely a distraction. I knew all the songs by heart now and I hoped GJ, DJ Pwn3 found something in the records we carried worthy of expanding his musical repertoire. This just in, DJ Pwn3 announced between songs, we got a report that a weak distress signal can be heard near Hoof Shore Tower. Horse Shoe Tower. Seems like back Blackwing's talents have managed to get themselves in over their beaks. Well, don't worry, Blackwing. Horseshoe Tower is pretty close to Sheriff Rottentail's territory. Maybe some of his ghouls will be willing to lend you a hoof. Oh wait, that's right. You and your Murdoch slaughtered them all. Well, good luck with that. This is DJ Pwn3, reminding every pony in the equestrian wastelands, you reap what you sow. Clement was flying back towards us. I turned off the radio with my pip buck as he landed on the monorail. Y'all gonna love this. Several minutes later, we had trotted far enough along the curve to see what Calamity had told us about. Ahead, the Celestial Line crossed over the Luna Line, about 20 feet above the Luna Line, running perpendicular to the two monorails below. The dark underside of the twin Celestial Rails struck me as bizarrely textured, giving me the creeps. Well, how do we get up there? Velvet Remedy scoffed. Clemente rolled his eyes and fluttered his wings. I'll carry y'all up, is how. Except, I'm thinking our Steel Ranger friend might be a bit too heavy for me. I can levitate him up as you carry me, 
I offered. Clemity nodded. All right, then. Just be careful, little Pip. Don't want you to disturb the blood wings. Blood wings? I floated out the binoculars, peeping through them at the celestial line, and cringed with a gasp. The shadowed underbellies of the monorails were covered with the grotesque, leathery forms of a dozen mutant bats. Yep, I reckon we want to make good time to Tamponi Tower. Reckon we don't want to be outside in the open come nightfall. As difficult as it was to get onto the Celestial Line, getting off the monorail was easy. Twilight had fallen as we rounded the bend and were met with a disgraceful arch of tarnished silver which flowed up and over the monorails. Through the arch, we could finally see Ten Pony Tower in its surprisingly well-preserved splendor. We had been catch glimpse catching glimpses of it above and between the buildings for hours, but only now could we really take in the size and ornateness of the structure. Light glowed behind more than half the windows, most of which bore fractures but were fully intact. The building narrowed every dozen stories, with a level ringed by a patio balcony. The fence around each spotted with crude repair. One whole side of Ten Pony Tower was blackened and sagging, bulwarked by patchwork reinforcements added over post-apocalyptic decades. The original name of the building had collapsed into the cobblestone cult yard below, and a huge radio broadcast tower rose from the roof towards the sky. The monorail passed under the archway, which would have been dazzling in the sun, and right up to Ten Pony Tower, where they ran through a Four Stars embarking station built into the side of the tower, many stories above the ground. From the tarnished arch hung a sign proclaiming, Ministry of Arcane Science, Manhattan Hub. Entering the station, we saw guard ponies barricaded themselves behind massive steel walls, watching our approach through narrow slits as they followed our progress with their guns. The walls of the station were decorated with life-sized paintings of ponies. Once the paintings had been protected by fields of magical energy, similar to Velvet Remedy's spell. Now, most of the paintings were blackened, damaged, or defaced beyond repair. The shields having failed, and the gemstones which held their enchantments stolen. All save for one. The painting of a familiar pink unicorn. Purple. The once pink and violet stripes on her mane most changed to gray. I hopped onto the sidewalk that ran along the wall, giving the painting a closer look. The edges were charred, and the paint had blistered in the heat, but the protective shield still held. The others paused, watching me, but I waved them on. I just want to look. I'll catch up. Each of my companions nodded and trotted on, none of them seeming to possess my curiosity. While no spring filly, Twilight Sparkle looked at least a decade younger in this painting than in the memory of Pinkie Pie's last party, and considerably happier. She was surrounded by crisp autumn colors, a dozen or a number of hazy, barely rendered ponies creating colorful blotches around her in the background. Her cutie mark was hidden, covered by a flank blanket, bearing the number 10. The running of the leaves, a voice announced from behind me, startled me so badly I nearly jumped back to my death. I turned to glare at the sprite bot, which seemed to have materialized out of nowhere. Twilight Sparkle ran it every year in Ponyville. Never won. To me, the mechanical voice sounded nostalgic. That was, until the Ministry demanded all of her time. I gazed at the purple pony, with a ten on her flank. Then I looked up to the mostly intact skyscraper, which had once been a Ministry of Magic hub. The massive letters 
that once advertised his name fallen and shattered to the ground below. And then I looked back. Heh. <laughs> I smiled. Turned to the sprite bot. How did you know Twy... But with a crack of static, Watcher was gone. The sprite bot suddenly spew a tuba music. I scowled as I watched the cipher spherical robot bob away. Was it just me, or were conversations with Watcher getting shorter? Ponies don't simply walk into Ten Pony Tower, the guard pony informed us, scowling through his armored window as he spoke to the intercom. The words, no zombies, were painted across the gate in huge red letters. We have business with DJ Pwn3, Velvet Remedy stated loftily. Although, if you want to explain to him why you turned us away, DJ Pwn3 is expecting you then? Absolutely. But the remedy lied silkily, and if I were you, I would not keep him waiting. Velvet Remedy gave an over uh, all of you. The voice was skeptical. Velvet Remedy gave an overly dramatic sigh. This is my bodyguard, she proclaimed, pointing to Calamity. I'm sure you'd recognize a member of the Steel Rangers. I, I do. And Velvet Remedy looked to me and seemed to draw a blank. Hastily, I offered. Toaster repair pony. Everyone gave me a strange look. His, um, toasters on the fritz? Velvet Remedy looked pained. The guard contemplated us silently. Finally, Velvet Remedy looked, and we said, Look, as much as I'd love to just stand outside while you get to trouble for not letting us in, it's getting dark. Would 100 bottle caps move us along any faster? 200. 125. And I don't tell GJ Pwn3 that she tried to extort his guests. Fine. The gun slot opened in the door. Slide the caps through. Then you can come in. I started pulling out and counting bottle caps. I was going to have to start building them back up into small pouches of 20 to make the sort of thing easier. 200 was a large chunk of the bottle caps we'd managed to acquire. But I wasn't worried. We had plenty of guns and ammo to sell once inside. Oh, the guard added, and you'll have to disarm before passing through the checkpoint. Stick a horn. Y'all ain't getting my battle saddle, lest you pry it off my cold, dead. The guard pony scoffed. Wouldn't expect to. You don't have to turn your firearms and battle saddles. Just your ammo. All of it. I raised my eyebrows in surprise. Unexpected. That also severely cut our trade goods, but at least left us with more expensive and heavier objects to sell off. As we passed through the checkpoint, the unicorn stepped out of the guard post and waved her horn over to us. Every clip, bullet, grenade, and massive and missile flashed visibly through Steel Hoof's metal armor. Toaster repair pony, she repeated with a demure smile as her gaze passed over my sniper rifle, combat shotgun, zebra rifle, assault carbine. I face hoofed. And a steel ranger, she asked as she removed the missiles from the left side of Steel Hoof's battle saddle. What's your story? Steel Hoof's whined. I'm just here to make sure you don't have any more of those nasty ghoul problems. Oh, that's no longer a concern, she smiled. But thank you for the concern. Indeed. Can't have a filthy ghoul walking around here anymore. Clemente was sh shooting Steel Hooves dark looks. Well, Remedy nickered under her breath, just loud enough to make sure she was heard. Oh yes, they're unsightly things. Can't imagine anything worse, except maybe a cult killer. Clemente neighed and rolled his eyes, lowering the brim of his hat. In minutes, we were divest of all of our ammo. You'll get all this back when you leave, the unicorn promised, primarily as she collected it all and floated it up to the guardhouse. I feel strangely naked, Calamity complained. At least my weapons had only to be reduced 
to fancy clubs. You can probably buy some rubber bullets from Chief Grimstar, if you really need to, the unicorn informed us, as the guardhouse door slid shut behind her. Calamity and I exchanged suspicious looks. It was the first I'd heard of any pony utilizing non-lethal ordnance. There was also a loud clank, as something released inside the ornate armored double doors in front of us. They opened, swinging inwards and revealing the marbled, chandelier-lit station lobby of Ten Pony Tower. We were getting looks. The idea of high society was completely foreign to us. We had nothing like this sort of bizarre elitism in the stable, too. The wasteland was a dirty, broken, rusted place that was completely at odds with stuffy behavior. The only reason a pony might walk around with their nose in the air in a place like New Appaloosa was because they didn't want to smell what they were walking in. Let us hurry and find a place to make bed, Velvet Remedy pushed. I need a bath. Hell, these folk are making me feel like I need a bath, Calamity said, his head low feeling the weight of all the stairs. You do. I nodded, wondering just how we would find a place to stay. We were walking across a area filled with high-class shops, or at least high-class relative to the rest of the equestrian wasteland. If we wanted to buy or sell anything here, Velvet Remedy had her work cut out for her. I suspected that she was the only one with enough merchantile saver fare to get these ponies to even talk to her. The other remedy seemed to read my mind. Once we've bathed and rested, we should split up. I'll take our goods to sell first thing in the morning, and then purchase us some new formal wear that'll help us blend in. Little Pip, you should look into meeting with DJ Pwn3. I agreed. I want to find a workshop. I want to modify my battle saddle. Until traveling with Little Pip, I've never had more than one type of ammo. I want to set up a quick way to swap between ammo types. Be nice to be able to use rubber bullets when the situation calls for it. He looked at Velvet and me. Y'all should give me your guns so I can do some proper maintenance on them while I'm at it. Velvet Remedy floated her needler pistol to him. Situations like shooting a colt, perhaps? Clemmy neighed. Nope. I see a raider. I'm gonna take him down. The rust-colored pony stared distantly and defiantly at Velvet Remedy, proudly insisting, it's my policy. It was a child, Velvet Remedy hissed, stomping a hoof. I looked around. My companions were beginning to make a scene. Um, maybe we should save this for... Any pony who chooses to be a filthy, murdering raider gets tried and perforated as an adult, Calamity asserted. And you think a cult or filly in that situation had any actual choice? Calamity's eyes narrowed, and he cocked his head. Well, maybe not. Damn tragedy. But I don't mean I'm gonna give him a free pass to rape and murder till he gets his cutie mark. His would-be future victims don't deserve that. Calamity's voice was rising dangerously. In case you didn't notice, my little rapist down there... Shut up! I finally ordered. I swear to the goddesses, I'm going to put you both in corners. Velvet Remedy and Calamity both bristled, but the interruption was enough to get them to look around and realize that this was not the place to be having that particular fight. The two of them remained silent for the rest of the evening, while I found thus a place at Golden Tail Luxury Suites. It was a beautiful room, the marble walls only slightly cracked. The thin bathtubs, the twin bathtubs, were only lightly stained, and the sheets on the beds were not too worn or frayed. I probably paid double what Velvet Remedy could have gotten him for, but I was just happy to get them away from the public. Tempers were more even the next morning. We had all bathed and washed our clothing. Calamity spent the first part of the morning sewing and patching our armor. My utility barding had been crusted with blood and punctured with bullet holes. Meanwhile, Velvet Remedy looked up at the weapons and scavenging items for trade and headed up to the stores that were about to open, wanting to look over her options. 
I spent the morning hungry. We decided that we would wait until Velvet Remedy returned, with proper ten-pony attire, before heading out to buy food. There were several swanky-looking restaurants that we passed on our way to Golden Tail Luxury Suites, and I was sick of canned and boxed pre-war food. Which is, as Velvet reminded us, well, we're most out of, and we need to stock up on. I took the chance to relax, laying on one of the beds and reading. I nearly finished all my books that I had collected, and my, and I had contemplated giving most of them to Velvet Remedy to sell, but in the end I decided that I'd rather keep them back at my Junction R7 library, home, and then start a library. When Velvet Remedy returned, bringing us new clothes, even a stately cloak for steel hooves. I nearly fell out of bed at the sight of her. She treated herself to a new coiffeur and pony petty. She was wearing a classy new dress with matching new jewelry along with a demure touch of blush. She fluttered her longer than ever lashes at me and I fell faint. Part of me hated her for making me want her so much. Wow, Velvet, you look... Clemity flushed, looking a little overheated. But he stammered about something, about hoping she had saved enough bottle caps for us to have a breakfast. She turned up her nose at him. Of course I did. Looking to me, she broke out into a gleeful grin, clumping her hooves. And we have plenty to do a little extra shopping. What do they have? Velvet Remedy smirked, rolling her eyes. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. These ponies have taken full of themselves to a whole new level, she snickered. Two floors down, there's a shop that only sells cheese. Right across from that shop is one that sells only wine. As classy as that as she could be, Velvet Remedy didn't put any more value into being snobbish than the rest of us. But of course, half the fun of shopping is just looking. Why? Was there something you were looking for? Some new books. And rubber bullets. Velvet Remedy sighed. The restaurant was classy and filled with prim looking ponies. I looked at my plate of food with a touch of desperation. I don't know why I had expected much more. It wasn't as if the ponies of Ten Pony Tower were farmers with a field of fresh grains. Instead, we got the same pre-war foods, only cooked in a new way, and served in teeny but artistic portions. It didn't take long to eat, and I was still hungry. After breakfast, we split up. Clamity and Steelhooves went to find Chief Grimstar, hoping to purchase bullets and possibly a suit of armored barding, more suitable for Velvet Remedy. The Zebra Legionnaire suit was stored away in Steelhoof's packs. Velvet Remedy didn't feel right wearing it, especially as we walked over the gra graves of countless ponies the Zebras had murdered, and I didn't blame her. But I hated to just leave it or sell it when it could be useful. Velvet and I went to purchase supplies. Food was a high priority, especially since I had no intention of eating at a restaurant again for as long as we were here. Looking at the rows of cans and boxes of fine edibles, I cringed at the prices. Maybe we should just get the minimum we need for the next couple of days. We're bound to find more if we do a bit of scavenging. Velvet Remedy agreed, but only because she had other intentions for the caps that we would, be, that we would save by doing so. We stocked up lightly, and then I watched as Velvet Remedy haggled with the shop clerk until she got us a discount. As soon as we left Fine Edibles, I found myself to be shoved into a spa, where Velvet Remedy absolutely insisted we both get full body treatments. I was resistant at first, but I began to unwind in the steam room, feeling muscles loosen that had probably been tight since my last night in the stable. I found myself letting out a grand sigh of relief. A couple of delightful spa ponies gave us an absolutely heavenly massage. This was easily the best caps I had ever spent, 
and truth be told, the spa mare hoofing my back was beginning to really turn me on. I heard that Fluttershy went to one of these places every week with my great, great, and a bunch of other great, grand auntie, Velvet Remedy confided as the lovely spa pony rubbed her hooves on my shoulders. I suddenly felt awkward. Later, as we lounged in a mud bath, my eyes spotted a book sitting in one corner. Curious, I floated it over to take a look. Principles of proper pony speech, I read aloud, refining how we think by refining how we speak. I opened the book and looked down the title page. At the bottom, in small words, Official Guidelines from the Ministry of Image. I decided I'd ask the spa pony if I could buy the book. We were returning to our room after the most delightful morning I'd ever probably had. My attention was focused on slipping my newly purchased book into my saddlebags when I collided with a stallion who was backing out of the cheese shop, knocking him over. My book fell onto the floor with a number of boxes full of cheese. I recovered and began to offer him my apologies and assistance but my eyes fell to the cheese-shaped cutie mark on his beige flank. You! Monteria Jack stood up, dusting himself off. Oh, it's you. The short gray unicorn wearing a refined full barding trotted out, looking over the scattered cheese. Then at us. Is there a problem here? Yeah, this pony tried to rob me after I saved his life. Now I was the one creating a scene, and I didn't care. Velvet Remedy was staring. Monteri Jack started picking up the boxes of cheese, lifting them with his teeth by their wrapping strings. He ignored me like I was a small, yapping animal. Is that true? The gray unicorn asked, looking to Monteri Jack. Monteri just snorted and finished stacking the cheese boxes, then focused, floating them towards the gray unicorn in the suit. Sorry about that, homage. I'll credit your account 10% for the rough handling. Yes, it's true, I supplied for the beige unicorn. Of course, his cutie mark looked like cheese. Monteri Jack ran a cheese shop. The guard pony in the MAS security armor had a LSW battle saddle and was riding towards us. Turning towards him, I pointed out Monteri. Sir, I'd like this pony arrested. The guard pony looked both of us up and down. On what charge? Attempted robbery. The guard chuckled. Monteri's jack's prices may be steep, but that's a stretch. I shook my head. No. I rescued him from raiders, and then repaid me by trying to rob me. Turning to glare on Monteri Jack, I added, They were going to shoot off your hooves, if I remember correctly. Maybe I should have let them. The guard looked at me skeptically. When was this? I paused. I double-checked the date of my pit buck. Three weeks ago. Had it really only been that long? I felt like it had been outside a lot longer. Sorry, the guard said finally. But it's your word against his, and frankly, seeing as you aren't a tenpenny citizen, your word doesn't mean much here. I fumed. You mean he gets away with it? Little Pip, Velvet Remedy said softly, putting a calming hoof on my shoulder. Put it in the past. He may have tried to rob you, but he didn't succeed. I shrugged off her hoof, and rounded on Materi Jack. So, you're going to just stand there and deny it? Are you? Well, I... No, he said firmly. I'm not going to... Wait, what? Monteri? How much was looking at the beige cheese shop unicorn? Her purchases momentarily forgotten. The guard pony had been suddenly stiffened. I have two colts and a filly to look after. I had made... I had to make it home safely and those supplies would have been wasted on you. You weren't even smart enough to loot corpses. You wouldn't have survived the week. 
clearly not. Velvet Remedy deadpanned. Monteri Jack, the guard said dangerously, do you realize what you're admitting to here? Monteri Jack snorted, staring at me. I'm not a liar, and I'm not ashamed of what I tried to do. Making sure my children still have a father is more important than some foolish little stranger who doesn't even have the good sense not to walk into a slaver camp. He looked to the guard. After Clarinet was killed, I'm all they have left. The guard pointed and aid. Well, probably not anymore. You know the law. Banditry will get you executed. Wait. Wait. What? Velvet Remedy gasped. The guard clamped the bit on his saddle, and I heard the light support weapon reload. Sorry, Monteri Jack, but you're going to have to come with me. Um, I've changed my mind. I'm not pressing charges. Nothing happened. The guard scowled at me. Sorry, kid, but it's your word against his. And like I said, your non-citizen word doesn't mean dirt on my hoof around here. I paced back and forth outside the elevator. This was insane. They can't kill a pony for trying and failing to rob some pony, could they? Goddesses, why did I have to open my mouth? Why couldn't I just keep my stupid mouth shut? The elevator doors opened. I left Velvet Remedy, looking into the laws of Tenpenny Tower, hoping that she could find something while I attempted to talk to DJ Pwn3. Stepping into the elevator, I added this to the list of things I wanted to ask him about. For that matter, why couldn't Monteri Jack just have kept his own mouth shut? In the equestrian wasteland, honesty was not always a virtue. The elevator began to glide upwards. I took a deep breath. I was about to meet DJ Pwn3. I wondered what to expect. I hope he'd be willing to talk with me. If not, this would have been a long walk for nothing. Well, no, not nothing. It was a long walk for a spa treatment. Actually, still somewhat worth it. The doors opened, and I stepped out into a rich marble foyer, the center of which was dominated by a water fountain. A huge alicorn, made of aged darkened brass, reared up before me, wings spread over the foyer. The necklace around the alicorn's neck bore a water talisman, with a large sapphire set into its center. Thanks to the talisman, the fountain still flowed with fresh, clean water, even 200 years after the apocalypse. I remember the pure, non-irradiated non water we had enjoyed in our baths and the spa. I wonder just how many water talismans like the MAS, the MAS had, had, and how many could benefit from them if they weren't all hoarded together from this one place. Stairs wrapped around the foyer into uh, another level. Inset in the balcony were matching bronze letters. Ministry of Arcane Science, Manhattan. Beyond the fountain was a large set of double doors bearing the title, Twilight Sparkle. Athenium above the mezzanine that was a second, nearly identical set of double doors. MAS, Emergency Broadcast Station. Authorized unicorns only. I took a deep breath and stepped towards the stairs. A second pair of elevator doors slid open behind me. I turned to see the gray unicorn mare, Homage, stepping out and looking around. I smiled, trying not to look nervous. You're here to see DJ Pwn3 too? The other unicorn nodded. She was about my size, the only other adult pony I'd seen who was born with a similar small frame. I waved a hoof for her to go first. She was a citizen, after all. When we reached the landing, the double doors to MAS EBS swung open quietly, making me think of the wild tale of Manhattan ghosts the traveling merchant had told us about. Inside were multiple mainframes and walls of computer screens filled with bird's eye views of the majority of the equestrian wastelands, as far as I could tell. 
Homage clopped past me as I stopped to stare, searching for the new Appaloosa on one of them. Impressive, isn't it? Homage asked. I nodded, noticing that while most screens had clear, sharp images, several flickered and suffered odd distortions, and one large set of screens was dead black. You've been in here before? A few times. She walked over to a bank of buttons and lights, raising a hoof, and pressed one. She turned and trotted back towards the center of the room, where the microphone was raising from the floor. Homage's horn glowed, and her voice changed by magic. Good morning, Wastelanders! Homage cried out over the mic, her voice now male and very familiar. How is every pony doing? This is your pal, DJ Pwn3, and, well, it's that time again. That's right, time for some news. I fell to my haunches. I stared at the little gray unicorn's voice belted over the airwaves. I heard a rumor that Monteri Jack, she shop owner, up in that oh so haughty totty Tempony Tower, has been arrested for deciding that being a thieving jackass was the appropriate response to the act of kindness. Remember what I keep telling you, my little ponies. Treat others with kindness and respect. Or don't, and watch it come back to bite you in the tail. In other news, some ponies finally arrived to fix my toaster. Hallelujah, it's breakfast time. Here's a little Sapphire Shores to get you through the morning. Ten minutes later, I stood on the windswept roof of Ten Pony Tower as Homage made a refining adjustment to the gemstone set into the center of one of the dishes of the broadcasting tower. I stared out over the gray labyrinth of Manhattan. From here, I could see another Ministry Hub building, which was considered worse for wear, Horseshoe Tower, and even the Pony of Friendship out in the harbor. Breathtakingly blue oceans stretched out until the waters vanished under offshore fog. Ironic, isn't it? Homage asked, her voice no longer that of DJ Pwn3. I'm told that statue was a gift from the zebra folk, generations before the war. I turned to look at her, but caught sight of something far off in the horizon that grabbed my attention. A needle-like white tower rose from all the way into the clouds. I blinked, realizing I'd seen it before, but not over there. Before, when I had spotted in the distance, it was... I turned to look out in the direction I knew the tower should have been, and saw that there were two of them. I pulled out my binoculars and slowly turned, scanning the horizon. Far off, protruding from the mountains near New Old Appaloosa, I thought I spotted a third. How many of these towers were there? I see you spotted them, Homage said casually. I lowered the binoculars. What are they? No idea, Homage admitted. Something pre-war and very sophisticated. What I do know is that each one of the station houses, a base, an observation eyes about a third of the way up. DJ Pwn3 managed to hack each one of them. Between those eyes and the reports from loyal listeners, DJ Pwn3 sin ever since have been able to keep ponies informed about dangers, uplifting the tales of heroes, and generally appraising what goes on in the wasteland, and give them beautiful music to help make life out there more bearable. It's all I can do to help everyone, but I figure the most I can do is the least I can do. I looked to homage with amazement bordering on re reverence. You, on the other hoof, it seems like can do a lot more. So, I'd like your help. Footnote. Level up. New perk. How we do it down on the farm. In combat, your critical hits are more devastating. Your damage from critical hits, including sneak attack criticals, is increased by 
This does not affect the chance to cause a critical hit.